and we can begin. I'm just going to share my screen. All right. Give me a nod if you can see if you can see that presentation. All right. Fantastic. So here we go. So welcome, everybody. Um, I am Steve Shaw. Uh, I'm the director and founder of Power for People. Um, we are a campaigning organization um, trying to help stop climate change. We uh, focus on energy. Um, as you may know, um, we want to see the UK transition towards 100% renewable energy um, as quickly as possible. And, and this is equally important, we want local communities to benefit. We want to, people to see benefits directly. Um, this is vital. Um, I founded Power People back uh, in 2017. My background is in campaigns just like the one we're going to talk about this evening and the one we're running, um, trying to uh, get regulations or the law changed. Um, and I worked on the Climate Change Act and a number of other um, number of other successful pieces of legislation that went through Westminster um, and did quite remarkable things. So I know that this works. I know how these kind of campaigns uh, work and can succeed. Um, so that's that's briefly me. Um, but as I said, I also have uh, the team with me this evening. Uh, and so what I'm going to do is just hand over to them. They're each going to just briefly tell you um, about their roles within the organization. Rupert? Thank you very much, Steve. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Rupert. I am the Campaigns and Engagement Officer at Power for People. Um, I've been there for around two years now, and I help coordinate our coalition of organizations and local councils, and I also help with MP engagement. Uh, it's lovely to see many of you here, um, including some familiar faces and names. Um, and yeah, thank you very much for coming. Hi guys, um, I'm Heidi. I'm the fundraising and campaigns officer at Power for People. Um, so from the title, you can probably tell the majority of my time is spent raising funds so that we can keep pushing to see the bill made law um, and deliver activities like um, this evening's. Um, actually, just a point on fundraising, I'd be remiss not to mention it now. The campaign is solely run on the generous donations of individuals and charitable foundations uh, who share in our ambition. We have a full list uh, of those funders on our About page on our website, um, but you can also donate to support the campaign on our website under the Take Action tab. We'd really welcome and really appreciate any donations if you are able. I just wanted to address that now because we've had questions on that in previous webinars. Looking forward to this evening. Thanks, Heidi. Karina? Hi, everyone. My name is Karina. Um, I only started at Power for People uh, earlier in January, so um, I'm the communications manager. So if you ever engage on social media, that will usually be with me, um, though I'm obviously um, thrilled to have behind me Heidi, Rupert, and Steve, always uh, teaching me as much as they can and um, helping me really get acclimated to this. And um, yeah, I'm very excited to, to experience this this evening. Uh, if you know of anyone who's missed the webinar, um, we will be posting it, uh, you know, we are recording, and we will be posting it on YouTube. I will also be writing a blog post, kind of summarizing what we spoke about and answering any questions. So thank you all for being here. I really appreciate it. Thanks very much, Karina. Um, and uh, yes, a, a great team we have. Uh, we're obviously, as you can see, a, quite a modest team. We also have some volunteers. I must um, pay big thanks to them, office volunteers, who come in and help. Um, but, uh, but we're lean, but we're effective. Um, so what we'd like to do now um, is just hear very briefly from you. We're going to do a quick audience poll. So the question is, uh, when did you hear about us? Um, and so we've got three simple options. So I'm just going to pop that poll up to you now. Um, so as you can see, it's uh, three options within the last three months, within the last six months, or more than six months ago. Um, so if you could just click one of those, that'd be great. Just give us a little sense of what we're looking at here. Oh, okay, everyone's answered it already. Fan, fantastic. So quick. Okay, so um, so there's the results. All right, so 69% of you um, have, have known us for more than more than six months. That's great. But um, yeah, a reasonable number as well, um, more recently. Interesting. Great to see. Okay, thanks very much uh, for that. 
Um, so, uh, as I say, we're going to we're going to focus on uh, the campaign tonight and actions that you can take. So the campaign, we call it the Community Energy Revolution. I'm going to be quite brief because I'm going to assume that you, you you've got a good idea um, about about it uh, in general. But just as a brief overview. Um, what is the problem we're trying to solve? Well, in the UK, there is a huge amount of potential for more community energy schemes, for more community energy generation. Um, and just to, just to give you two numbers that really well summarise that, um, at the moment, we have about 300 megawatts of community energy generation across the UK. It's not very much, it's about half a percent of all the UK's electricity generation. And the potential that we're told from various studies and so on that it could be, is is 6000 megawatts uh, by 2030 um, so um, that is a 20 fold potential increase so huge potential that is currently being blocked by rules um, regulations uh, and the energy system um, the solution is is the bill um, it's it's we it's not the only thing that could help, but what, but what it would do, allowing community energy schemes to sell their power directly to local customers, so we could become the customer of um, a local energy provider that was community run, um, that would that would then um, go a very long way in in terms of realising that huge potential. Um, and so that is what the local electricity bill does: reforming rules, not about subsidies. It would reform the rules and allow that local supply to happen. So um, I'd like to give you an update on where we are at. Campaign's been going for a few years now. These campaigns take a while, um, but progress is good. Um, and, um, and I'm probably gonna thank you a few times this evening, but I'll start with a, with a thank you because progress is because of the efforts um, that everyone has been making um, individually on the ground and in, in as groups. So, you know, you are, you, if you've done anything, you've led to this, uh, to the situation we're at now. So first, the support, uh, 290 MPs uh, in Parliament, that's very strong cross-party amongst those um, 117 Conservatives, 106 Labour, so very strong cross-party support among them. To give you an, an idea, that's, um, that's getting close to half the House of Commons, half the House of Commons 325, so it's going well because it's, it's, it's got impressive uh, momentum there. 100 councils, by councils I'm talking about local authorities uh, and county councils, um, there's, that's about a quarter of all the UK's councils, so that's, that is promising, that could be a lot higher uh, and certainly needs to be, but that's, that, is, that is going well, been a little bit of a delay there because um, a lot of them are very, very caught up with, um, with, with uh, the pandemic and now are freeing up more, so we're seeing that, that momentum pick up. Um, we have a big coalition, lots of national NGOs, um, industry organizations, charities, etc., um, all the big environmental organizations you, you would recognize, many others, um, all helping. I won't list them now, they're all listed on our website, as are the MPs and the councils I've just mentioned. Um, and also lots of local and regional groups, which is fantastic as well, very helpful. Uh, Rupert mentioned how that's one of the parts of his role. Um, so if you're from one of those groups, welcome especially to you and thank you so much for, for being involved in that way. Um, uh, and then I put Keir Starmer there. Um, and it is, it is uh, quite notable that Keir Starmer um, formally and publicly supported the bill uh, just before Christmas. Um, he 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 joins obviously lots of MPs in his party, including a whole bunch of um, of his of his shadow front bench colleagues. Um, and also, it's it is it's obviously not just the Labour Party. It's now Green Party policy, so, um, and it's also uh, Liberal Democrat Party policy. So you know we've got some we've got strong support there. Um, secondly, talk about. Uh, more recently, um, debates that we've had, particularly a debate uh, that was held in Parliament, uh, focusing on the bill uh, in at the end of November last year. This was a really well uh, attended debate. These kind of debates usually get a small number of MPs. Um, there was about uh, there was about 15 there. Um, a lot of the lead sponsors of the bill were there. Um, and the purpose of these debates is basically to, um, to really push the government and make the government see that um, MPs are really in, in, interested and, and keen on an issue. And so they use this opportunity to push the energy minister, it's called Greg Hands, um, and to, to, to engage more with the campaign to meet uh, with us, um, which is something we, we'd not yet done. Um, 
and basically just to, to put more pressure on the government. We need government support. Um, now, this was not the only debate. We've had several other debates going back um, over the last um, couple of years, but this this was a very, very good one. It went very well. And it, we had we got what we wanted. The, the minister said at that um, at that at that debate in his response that he would meet with us and indeed that's now happened um, so I met so this is the this is the, the latest the absolute latest for you I met with Greg Hans last week um, it was myself uh, and four of the MP co-sponsors of the bill um, including uh, David Johnston, Hilary Benn um, and Vera Hobhouse um, and he, Greg Hans uh, had four of his um, Whitehall civil servants with him, experts um, on the government policy side. Um, and it was a constructive discussion. And I'm going to tell you and talk a little bit more about his position and the, and the coming, you know, the, and the government's position on the bill and their concerns or <laughs> what they say are concerns. Um, but it was, a, it was constructive. It was another step. Um, and he asked that um, his officials, his civil servants, continue to meet with myself and experts from the campaign to try and figure out a way that we can all agree, because ultimately we will need government support. So um, it was another step forward. We, um, it was very, very encouraging. And just to give you some context as well, th this, is, this is not usual. Um, lots of, there are obviously lots of wonderful campaigns and initiatives happening around the UK um, and to be able to do this, to be able to meet face to face like that with the minister and their civil servants um, and get a commitment like that um, is uh, is hard to do. And it shows how far we have come um, and it shows that we've got real promise here of actually achieving something. Um, so let's talk exactly about the government's position, because this is getting really important now. Um, so this is a summary of what they are saying about the bill and what we're trying to the change that we are trying to make. Um, so just to remind you, which, what we're trying to do is create the situation where community energy schemes could sell directly to local customers, um, because that would then make more of them viable. Um, so whilst it, on the surface that quite, sounds quite simple, it's, it's obviously quite a substantial reform to the rules um, that govern our energy system at the moment. Um, uh, completely doable in our view, but nevertheless substantial. So the government's position, and I'll go through each of these and tell you um, what, what, why we think that the government's arguments um, are uh, <laughs> unfounded. So first, the government say that there's existing mechanisms and funds. So they talk about um, license, the ability to, um, to be licensed and sell locally already. Um, and they talk about various uh, funds that they have, such as uh, the Rural uh, Community Energy Fund. Um, and there are other, there are other government, fun government funds, these are subsidies essentially, that they, that they mention. Um, they mention the Leveling Up Fund, for example. And if you watch the debates that I mentioned back in November, the minister mentions all these things. So in terms of existing mechanisms, they're actually right. It is possible to be licensed to sell energy locally, but that's not the problem. The problem is, that the costs involved in doing so are immense. And so whilst it, it's legally been possible for a long time, all of the suppliers we have operate at national scale and not a single energy community energy scheme has local customers. It's just too expensive. So it's, it's, it's not about the fact that there might be an ability to be licensed. It's about the fact that the rules make it impossibly expensive. Um, interestingly, the minister actually acknowledged this point. So the government's position on this is a little garbled. Um, but nevertheless, um, you will see potentially, particularly if any of you have conservative MPs who haven't backed the bill, you will see potentially when they message you, they, they might say that. Um, and so um, it is it, it's no consequence. Um, the In terms of the funds that exist, um, to give you an example of the Rural Community Energy Fund, it only applies to England. It's existed for over six years, but the community energy sector has seen almost no growth in six years, and obviously way below that enormous potential that I talked about. The government report back in 2014 said that by last year, there could have been 3,000 megawatts, so there could have been a tenfold increase, and there hasn't been. So to then point to a fund like the, the Rural Community Energy Fund and say, oh, well, we've got this fund, so isn't that great? I mean, the evidence is, is so abundantly obvious that the, the fund is not doing, is not realising the potential, and it's reform that's needed, reform of the system. Um, now, of course, of course, we welcome, you know, if there's public money available, um, 
But then the government also pointed to these other funds like the leveling up fund. The leveling up fund is for a whole range of things. Um, and we know examples, perhaps some of you know, where community energy schemes or, or potential ones have tried to apply, um, have not been successful. So to point to these funds and say, you know, they're going to solve it um, is, is wholly inadequate um, and a little bit laughable to be, to be a bit blunt. Um, second thing the government say, is that um, oh well the bill will create distortions in the market? Um, you're trying to you know you're because you're trying to change the market rules. Well, that's gonna that's gonna essentially kind of mess things up from how they are. Um, <laughs> the answer to that is the bill's actually going to fix distortions in the market. The market is distorted, and we're trying to we're trying to make those distortions not as bad as they are at the moment. The distortions are completely in favour of very large utilities. So all of us are, are buying our electricity, our energy from um, from a, from big nationally licensed, nationally operating utilities, um, and 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 only those uh, size scale companies are viable. Um, and we we want that distortion to be removed. We want it to be where you can operate at different sizes and different scales because that's what's going to help realize the potential. Um, so again, you know, to talk about market distortions is is spurious. And again, the government's position on this is a little garbled because the 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 previous energy minister um, acknowledged that the the rules that that run the energy system have hardly changed since the 1990s anyway, and are in major need of reform. Um, and thirdly, um, what they like to say is that if you had these smaller energy suppliers, so if we had community schemes selling directly to local customers, well, then you get these two problems. You get you get there's various obligations that existing uh, utilities uh, have to meet, such as helping vulnerable customers and so on. Um, uh, there's there's certain ones to do with um, helping people in fuel poverty. Um, there's a requirement to insulate homes, things like that. Um, and also that then these smaller supplies, they'd be avoiding costs. And of course, we have to pay for things like the grid. So you can't have suppliers avoiding costs. Who's going to pay for the grid? Who's going to pay for the infrastructure, the wires, etc.? cetera? Um, now, with regards to the first one, um, it, it, on the surface might seem reasonable, but it's completely addressable. Uh, there are, it's, it's completely possible that a, a non-national, a smaller supplier, could um, meet obligations. There's the price cap, for example. There's no reason why um, why a smaller supplier couldn't implement the price cap. Um, there is also um, no reason why um, they couldn't insulate local homes. Um, that in, indeed, some community energy groups already insulate um, the homes and have and have projects that do that locally. Um, now, of course, they would be needing to meet a specific obligation and. And it is a reasonable position to take that maybe um, there would be larger obligations that would make it harder. But what you could have is a kind of offsetting situation. So um, you could have them pooling money and then that money and on, on pooling funds on a on a proportionate basis. And then that money paying for a body that did a separate body that did things like the insulation uh, more efficiently. You have this in other areas um, of government policy. Um, you have this other areas of energy policy, actually. Um, and you also have it in things like planning. Um, you have it in the financial system. Um, you have there's a requirement on um, big financial institutions to all contribute money based on their size. Banks and so on do this um, to, uh, in case um, there are um, there are claims um, in terms of if a bank has misbehaved or if a financial lender has misbehaved. Um, so, you know, the, the, the policy principle is there. Um, I actually put this point to the minister and he, he accepted it. Uh, so, so, you know, the possibility is there, but we're probably going to need some kind of a pooling mechanism or something like that. Um, and then finally, this the, the government's uh, position on saying that, oh, well, these smaller new suppliers, they'd avoid costs. No, they would not. So that if you ever see that, written in a letter, particularly if you have a conservative MP, um, that is absolutely not what we are calling for or saying, and that is not what the bill says. Of course, costs must be paid for. We are talking about proportionality. Um, so we want costs to be paid for, but proportionally. Uh, some of you might have heard of my van analogy. You know, if you have a if you have a delivery company and you are small and local and you have one van, you are paying for the road tax and the fuel duty of that one van. And if you have a massive national delivery company, when you have a thousand delivery vans, you're obviously paying a lot more road tax and, and fuel duty because you've got a thousand vans. It's actually quite a good proportionate system. There's no reason that it can't be applied here. Um, and it is what the bill seeks to do. So and that is that is that is the government's position broadly. Um, I would add one thing to this. There is a good set of points and principles that we and the government agree on. We agree that there is 
enormous potential. They accept everything I said earlier about that. Um, they have said that costs are a barrier. So that's great. And what they've also said is that not only would realizing the that huge potential for more community energy schemes, energy generation, uh, would obviously be good directly for things like reducing greenhouse gas emissions um, renew and renewable generation. Um, it's got a lot of knock-on benefits. There will be knock-on social benefits, local economic benefits, more skilled jobs, etc. So that so we, we, there's more and more common ground. Um, and, and I say more and more because that the, that point about costs being being a barrier, that's new from the government. The government didn't concede that until that debate that happened in Parliament uh, back in November. So again, you know, we are we are making steady step-by-step -step progress and headway all the time. Um, talk about the pathway to success. So um, we, de we are definitely in a situation where we can succeed now. Um, it doesn't mean it's easy and it doesn't mean we're close, but you can really see the promise. I mean, the ob most obvious number is 290 supportive MPs, nearly at half the House of Commons, um, particularly now with you know, Keir Starmer coming on board. So potentially a lot more Labour MPs coming on board. So we need to get a House of Commons majority. Um, and in my experience, and as I said, I, I have worked on a number of other campaigns that got laws through Parliament, such as the Climate Change Act, the Doorstep Recycling Act, that, that is why we all put out our weekly recycling collection, for example, and others we always got substantially more than half the House of Commons. So usually we were getting up to around 400 supportive MPs um, at the point at which um, we, we, we got the success we needed. Um, and that is because whilst technically, of course, you can always win a vote on a bill um, if you have exactly half the House of Commons plus one, it doesn't really work like that because you really, you need government support. Government does have a lot of control over parliament and the way the timetable in parliament works. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, we need more MP support way beyond half, um, which I believe we absolutely can get. Um, the second thing is the type of bill that it's going to then be. So at the moment, the bill is a, is, is, is a backbench bill called a presentation bill. So it would never actually see a debate and a vote. That's just uh, the nature of, of how it works. But what we'll need to do is get the bill introduced as either a ballot bill or a government bill, because those are the only two types of bills that get time for debate and to be voted upon. So the only two that actually have a chance. Um, the chance to introduce a ballot bill will be coming up probably in May. When we've got to confirm this actually because the, there's been some strange announcements to do with the parliamentary timetable, but probably in May. So heads up on that. Um, but uh, the other way would be if we actually got, if these negotiations with government went well, as they have started, then it may be that the government actually, um, you know, agrees and we, it goes through as a government bill. Although that doesn't mean it's, it's the end of the road because we'll need to make sure the government bill is actually, um, is what it needs to be. Um, that's how the Climate Change Act went through in, in 2007. And it, I mean, it was, <laughs> it was quite an adventure, um, but in the end it all went well. Um, we also need to improve the bill. At the moment, it's short, it's only a page long, it contains the principles, and there's gonna be details needed to be added. Those points I just mentioned um, about ways that we can address the concerns from the government, whilst we've obviously got the answers there, um, or at least we certainly think we do there, um, the detail that I talked about there will need to be included in amendments. It might not be exactly what I just said there, it might be something better or, or, or different, but the, we're going to have to make the bill more detailed. So if any of you have looked at the bill and thought, hang on, this is a little bit, uh, this is a bit, this is a bit short, how's this going to work? That's because at the moment it's still the principle that we need to push, and it's only when we get that majority support that we can start getting the detail in and getting the detail right. Um, by the way, these four points are not necessarily in chronological order, as you might have already realised. Um, but yeah, ultimately, it is government support we need, um, and we are getting close. Um, so another quick poll before I start talking about the real meat of this evening, or, uh, <laughs> or corn, perhaps, if you're vegan. Um, we just want to hear um, if you've written to your MP already about the bill. So a quick poll coming here. If you could please participate. So we've got three options. So it's either yes, and then there's two no's. So it's no, but you have written to your MP about something else at some point in the past, or it's no, you've never written to your MP about anything. All right, nearly got everyone in. Just 
just a few more. Okay, a few stragglers. All right, I'll end, I'm going to end it now. Maybe someone's gone to make a cup of tea. There we go. Okay, so interesting here. So, ooh, oh, I've got an error. Can, any, can everyone see this? Not if you can see the results. Can you see the results? Oh, good. Okay. Okay, good. So, yeah, great. All right, so 63%, you've written about the bill. Brilliant. Absolutely fantastic. And thank you so much. Um, I mean, that that more than anything is why we've we've, we've done as well as we've done already um, and we've got all this fantastic support so thank you so much and actually i know a lot probably it's a lot of you i know a lot of us um have written more than once so thank you so much um and then okay so yeah strong engagement um only a few of you oh nearly 10 percent though who've never written to their mp at all interesting okay interesting oh well i'm very glad you're with us this evening um well let's move on so I want to talk about actions you can take and obviously I just mentioned write to your MP but it's only one of four. Um, again, these are not necessarily in chronological order, but this is uh, this is often the sort of scale of uh, um, of action that we see. Um, so very much the first thing we ask people to do is write to their MP and thank you to those of you who have. Um, it is so important that you write to your MP. I cannot emphasize this enough. No matter how difficult you think they are, no matter how much of a rubbish response you you get or you're expecting to get, you've got to write. And by write, we don't just mean once. You've got to keep writing. And all the time, we are seeing examples where MPs keep sending out the party response or 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 just a fob off. But then they change their mind because they've had enough of the of the letters and the correspondence coming in and they just they change their mind and they say yes um a great example was jeffrey clifton brown recently um a conservative um over over near um over near i think it's sirencester way uh, in the west country um interestingly my sister is one of his constituents she could not believe that eventually he said yes but he said yes it works and even if it doesn't work in terms of your mp saying all right i will support the bill it's still helpful because if it comes to a vote and they might think again about voting against it, or they might be chatting to their colleagues in, in the corridor saying, well, yeah, you know, I, I've just continually had messages about this. So it's so important. If you write to your MP, please always, always share any response you get and we can help you with a customized reply. There's, there's, they are obviously saying various things, a lot of them spurious, um, like I've already alluded to, and we can we can help you with the commenting back and the debunking. It's so important to keep going back. Um, the second thing, this is possibly easier actually, please sign up one other person. Um, we are continually growing um, as a movement, which is great, um, but we want to be much bigger. Um, we're approaching um, twenty thousand individual. Uh, people on on in the movement in on this on the list for this campaign which is which is fantastic given it went from a zero start but obviously we could be a lot bigger we really want to be a lot bigger so please sign up one person make that your make that your target um thirdly i haven't talked about councils much we really need more councils we've only got about a quarter of them and by councils, I mean local authorities here, not, not parish or town councils. Um, so please write to your councillors, ask them to, um, to put a motion down to back the bill. That's how a council backs the bill. Um, or it is possible that the leader of the council can just make a statement. Um, if you want some guidance on this, obviously get in touch. But if just write to your councillor and say, you could just say simply say, can you please try and get your council uh, the council to support the bill. Um, you'll each have about three councils. Usually you have three councils. You can find them easily by looking on the council website. Um, again, you can share, share, us, share with us any replies you get. Uh, fourthly, um, now this is, this is more of a challenging one, but this is becoming much more important um, as the campaign is maturing. Please meet with your MP. Um, and that includes if they're supportive. Um, in fact, it's possibly even more important if they're supportive because we need, we're gonna need them um, to commit to doing more, to promoting it in parliament. Um, I mentioned that debate we had, in November last year, that only came about because of the really enthusiastic, supportive MPs that we've got. They have to make quite a bit of extra effort to, to put in and raise debates like that um, and then turn up to them. So um, please go and meet with your MP. We can help you with this. If you've not done it before, 
don't be intimidated. I, on lots of campaigns I've worked on like this, lots of people have gone and met their MPs for the first time. Um, it's really not that hard. You don't need to be some kind of expert. It can be a very simple, short thing. I promise you, it will be a positive, engaging experience. I pro I, we, will, we will help you along the way. Um, we can connect you with others in, in your constituency if we have any other supporters, which we very likely will. So if you want to go on a long group or you can go on your own, it doesn't matter, but please do it. Um, it's becoming much more important because the, if you'll forgive the expression, particularly if there are any MPs listening, the low hanging fruit um, has passed. You know, some of the MPs who are, who are now um, not yet backing it are the ones who obviously probably had quite a few letters already and you know it's getting to the point where maybe a visit from a constituent or a group of constituents will kind of raise their eyebrows enough to think actually yeah I really you know I've, I've just put that off too long all right let me what is this thing oh okay um, and you, you might think what you know all that lobbying and the, they still haven't fully engaged they're very busy and I, it's, it's remarkable I've seen this I've seen this many times and it is weird you think well why is an MP you know why, why after 10 letters they didn't back it but then in the 11th letter they did or the 15th letter they did or but it, it's they're all different and you're just going to keep going until they say yes um so they're the four key things you can do now i'm going to go into a bit of detail about how to engage with your mp and it'll hopefully give you an idea of the nuance of this all so we've got three categories here as you can see so um, the first thing of course is is your mp supportive already or, or are they not um you can quickly find this out by looking up the list on our website. Um, if they're supportive, what you're going to be asking them is different to if they're not. Oh yeah, and perhaps um, I took it for granted. When you write or engage with your MP or counselors in any way, always have a single specific thing you are asking them to do. Always, always, always. If you're asking them to help with something and that's literally all it is, they'll probably just say, oh, absolutely I will and you've kind of got nothing. Always have a specific ask. I think that's why we are so effective and the project, the campaigns I've worked on in the past have been effective because we've always pushed that specific ask. Um, so if they're supportive, you need a specific ask. Obviously, if they're not supportive, it's pretty straightforward. Will you back the bill? Although there's some nuance within that, but let's just talk about supportive MPs first. So if, if, if they're supportive, then it doesn't really matter what their position is backbench, shadow front bench, government front bench, although they won't be government front bench, um, you'll need to ask them to do something more. And the best thing at the moment for you to ask them to do is to take it up as a ballot bill. So you remember I talked about ballot, ballot bill being one of the ways that we can actually see success here? They will have the opportunity to go to put their name into the ballot, as it's called, literally like drawn out of a hat. Um, as we say, we think it's coming up in May, although if it's not, it will be soonish after that. Um, and this is a great time now that we've, we're approaching half the House of Commons in support to get the supportive one saying, yeah, OK, if I'm drawn in the ballot, I'll choose this bill because they can only pick one bill. Um, unfortunately, there's only a very small number of MPs who are drawn. Um, so the more who say, yes, yes, I promise if I'm drawn, I'll take up this bill, the better. So that's the thing to ask them now if they're supportive. Um, it doesn't really matter as well which party they're from because um, they've backed it. Um, um, and so uh, that's great. Um, although it, it, you might want to mention if they say a Liberal Democrat, you know, oh, really great to see that. Uh, you know, the, your party's you know, backing this as policy, or indeed, if it's if you're in Brighton, it's Caroline Lucas, the Green. Um, if they're if your MP is Labour, then great to mention how the leader Keir Starmer is now backing it. Really pleased about that because I think a lot of them don't have don't quite realise that, despite our information. Um, so, um, uh, oh, and if they're a Conservative, uh, good to mention how there are 117 Conservatives backing the bill already. Um, so they sort of feel like they're amongst colleagues and amongst many. Um, and that, that, by the way, is, has raised eyebrows all over the place. Bit of a tangent, but just, just so you appreciate. The minister, that was the one point the minister really, really said back when I met him. Um, you know, gosh, it's really quite, it's quite remarkable, isn't there? There's so many of our backbenchers backing this. Um, this does not happen very often. I've had, I've had um, renewable energy lobbying groups get in touch with me and say, how on earth have you got over a hundred Tories backing this? This is incredible. We work for months, years to try and get a dozen Tories to back a project or a request that we, and we can't, how have you done this? So, you know, we, it's, it's worth mentioning if, you're, if your MP is conservative, it's worth mentioning. Um, 
Now, let's talk about if they're not supportive, um, because this is probably a bit more of the, of, the, of the interesting category. So then the first thing is, are they a backbencher? Um, so um, for those of you who aren't aware, the backbenchers are the ones who don't have a formal, uh, a formal role within their party. If they're a conservative, they won't be a minister, so they won't be on the front bench. Um, when, you, when you see Prime Minister's Question Times, it is literally the, physically the front bench where they sit. Um, so you're a member of the government if you're a conservative and you're on the front bench. And then all of the opposition parties have shadows to those positions on the on the front bench on the other side of the House of Commons. Um, so obviously that's where you know Keir Starmer and, and Angela Rayner and, and similar sit. Um, the the official opposition is the Labour Party's shadow front bench, but actually all of the opposition parties um, do have shadow front benches. It's less of a of an importance um, when they are not um, a Labour MP. So whilst the Liberal Democrats, for example, or the SNP, you know, they have shadow front benches, the, 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 the way that they behave, particularly with regards to supporting a bill like this, is, is really not, um, it doesn't, they wouldn't, they wouldn't give it as a reason to not be supportive. Um, so if your MP is a backbencher, then there is no reason at all that they will not support this. Um, if your MPs are conservative, they might say, oh, I'm a, I'm a PPS. So I can't, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't put my name to this. PPS is a parliamentary private secretary. Um, each uh, government department has one. So they're a backbencher, but they kind of have a, a sort of a semi-official role within government, sort of. Um, if you hear that from an MP, wrong. There are over half a dozen PPSs already backing the bill. Um, and you could simply write back and say that, or if you want, show us the, well, please show us the message and we can help you with how, wording that exactly right but so the key point is there is no reason any backbencher cannot back this bill but what you might hear sometimes um from from shadow front bench is oh well i'm on the shadow front bench so I, you know we don't really back this um now the thing to do is is to say oh well if they're labor to say oh well Keir Starmer's on board brilliant so clearly that's not true clearly front benches he's the, he's the he's the most senior shadow front bencher of all um so you want to say that back to them and engage on that basis um but the one real nuance here is if your MP is on the government front bench. So you've got a conservative MP and they're a minister or a junior minister or a whip, um, or if you're in Boris's constituency, they are not going to support the bill now. And they only would if it becomes government policy. And at that point, as I mentioned, we are, well, pretty much there as far as success goes. Um, but what you can do is you can ask, will you please support the bill in principle, it might sound like a bit of a silly nuance, but it's actually really useful. And uh, we already have um, a, uh, a, sh a front bench MP. Uh, he's a Treasury Minister, um, John Glenn MP, who has who has said very clearly to his constituents, "I support the bill in principle." It's very helpful, really helpful. Um, it's also a great thing to bat back at them if they say, oh, you know, I can't, I can't, I'm sorry, I can't. Um, and of course, you can mention, oh, well, I'm really happy to see that, you know, Treasury Minister John Glenn uh, supports the bill in principle. So then there's no reason they can't. Um, but again, share the answer with us. And if you uh, if you'd like some assistance. Um, Steve, I'm just going to jump in now before we move on to party. We've got about 14 minutes left and we've got lots of questions. Oh, dear. Um, which I think we're going to have to do as a rapid fire um, last 15 minutes. So yeah, if you want to address the party bit, I think that could be helpful and then we'll move on. I think I've addressed it addressed it enough. Yeah, I've, I've gone on a little too long. Apologies, everyone. Well, let's go. No, it was good. It was good. I hope everyone else has been enjoying it. Um, so first question is, um, Tom Muirhead said, I live in a large housing estate consisting of three low rise continuous blocks, very suitable for PV panels. We need arguments to convince the council to let us to do it. So Steve, how do you convince your council to get behind community energy and, and the bill? Um, I think you could, there are, in terms of getting behind community energy generally, there's lots of councils uh, in um, urban areas, metropolitan areas, as well as rural areas who are working with community energy groups. Um, if you want to send us an email, we can give you some good examples. But I think that's the first thing to say. Talk about the successes that are happening um, with the existing schemes, because there's some great ones um, all around the country. The second, the second thing with regards to the bill itself, say how there's a hundred local authorities already backing the bill um, and say it's it's just commitment in principle. They're not committing to spending anything or doing anything. It's just a statement of support uh, for, for the bill. And again, if you'd like a bit more assistance, let us know. 
Okay, great. Uh, question two. So Lindsay from Ringwood Actions for Climate Emergency in the New Forest. Hi, Lindsay. She says, our MP, sir, as Desmond Swain, does support the local electricity bill, but I need to know how we can get him to actually take action in capitals further up the chain. We're very keen to get a community energy grid going. Steve, what do you think? Great. Yeah, well, it's like, I mean, great. And, and thank you and well done. Um, so, like I said, that ask him if he'll take it up as a ballot bill if he's drawn in the ballot. Um, that's that would be a really important commitment. Um, there are other things you could ask him to do beyond that, but I, please, if you could, if you could do that first. Great. Um, third question. I will be sorry. I don't know who asked this. My apologies. Uh, it says I will be meeting with our MP with the Climate Coalition Green Hearts Show the Love campaign in two weeks. That's really great. And I want to tackle him with this. Then, do you have any suggestions for this meeting? So. Yeah, any advice for meeting with your MP? Thanks. Yeah, so we've got a we've got a briefing for you, short, punchy briefing uh, that actually Rupert was working on this afternoon. Um, so we can send that to you. Um, uh, but the the key the key thing, as I said, be specific. So it's a short, specific request. You don't need to know all about the bill. So you can just say, look, I've heard about this uh, campaign. I like it. The the bill is called the Local Electricity Bill. If you you could just say oh, I'm going to send you a briefing or hand him is it was it him a uh, briefing um, and say and say look I really would like you to support this bill will you please support this bill see what they say great um, so more of a question specifically on renewable energy systems so we've had a couple of different people mention um, different systems we've got Melanie saying there's some issues around heat pumps they're noisy they don't generate generate enough heat Tom again says. Please make sure the energy is not generated from small nuclear. Uh, Cherry Waters says, I trust you don't include the burning of wood biomass as sustainable. So I guess, Steve, what is our position as a campaign on heat pumps, nuclear and burning of wood or any other specific um, energy generation system? Okay, that's great. I'm glad I can clarify this. So we are on, this campaign is only for renewable generation and the bill specifically is only for renewable generation. Um, there was a concern about uh, an earlier version of it uh, where it could have potentially allowed um, smaller diesel generators uh, to then obviously generate electricity burning diesel and then sell that locally. Um, and we have closed that loophole uh, with an amendment. Um, but th th there is, this will only, only, I mean, nuclear, no, this is completely irrelevant. Um, with regards to, um, uh, heat pumps. This is about this is about generation um, at a slightly larger scale than just domestic, um, and it's about then selling the energy, the electricity that gets generated. So obviously, a domestic heat pumps. This campaign isn't about that. Um, we we haven't. So yeah, we haven't got a, a position on that. We're not trying to we're not trying to fix that or improve that situation. Okay, great. Thanks, Steve. Um, next question from Anthony Clayden. Hi, Anthony. He says. Is there a danger that community energy companies would be vulnerable in the way that some green energy companies have gone into administration due to the rise in electricity prices? So, Steve, what do you think? A very topical question. Yeah, great question. Yeah. And um, you'll see this from some, um, you know, responses from some elected representatives saying, oh, this is, you know, this is a terrible idea. This isn't the time for, for small suppliers. They're all going bust. Oh, no. But this is the, op it's the opposite. It's the, we are trying to create um, a more stable market that allows them to exist so um the reason that those suppliers have have struggled and gone bust is because they were um they were they were badly run um and the massive spike in international gas prices was too much for some of them in interestingly some of those some of the smaller utilities good energy is a good example um were well run um were well hedged as it's called which is a, it's a way of making sure you can absorb a, an external price shock um and they're fine um, now, the reason this kind of cowboy cavalier situation had, had arisen is because of the existing market rules. Um, you also, some of you may know about um, energy companies such as the one set up by Nottingham City Council called Robin Hood Energy and similar um, energy companies like that, um, that, that just wanted to be a local energy company. Um, they, they have unfortunately failed or they're struggling. Um, and the reason they did was the reasons I alluded to at the start and the, and the problems we're trying to fix, which is they're having to operate at national scale. 
and they're having to sell to customers all over the country when they don't even want to because of these enormous costs involved. It only works at the moment if you are a national supplier, if you're a massive national utility. So we're trying to create a stable situation. If we make the cost proportionate, then we actually create more robust, resilient market structure. Um, also, of course, we increase the mix of uh, renewable generation, and it means we have less reliance on imported gas, which is the big thing that has knocked a lot of these uh, of these of these companies out of business. Okay, great, Steve. Thank you very much. Super quickly, and I'm not even going to mute myself with um, the question on wood biomass. What burning wood biomass? What do you think about that in terms of the campaign? Um, the so we. We want it to be renewable generation. Is wood biomass renewable? That's contentious. Um, I'd, it's not the intention um, that something like that um, succeed. At the moment, it's, um, it's a grams per, um, per megawatt hour, grams of carbon emission per megawatt hour that, that sort of tries to close the loophole. I don't, I'm not sure that is the best way. I, mean, I think what's gonna be needed, remember how I talked a little bit earlier about, um, we're gonna need to add detail in um, improve and, and amend the bill. Um, and I think what's going to be needed is just a real clarity on the exact types of generation. So we obviously want solar, wind, hydro. Um, so yeah, th there's, you, you just you know, have to take an assurance from me. And remember, ultimately, I'm not going to, I can't literally control what the MPs decide, but um, it's not going to be about promoting um, anything but um, renewable generation that is and it can't be contentious either because I mean I know what um, power stations like Drax are doing in terms of biomass and we can't have that okay great thanks Steve so we've got six minutes left so we're going to try and squeeze in as many as we can so um let's get a question could a it's Anthony Clayton again could a community electricity company feed directly into homes via district heating network rather than via the grid Steve what do you think so this is this is for electricity only. So heat networks, um, that's a separate and very meritable area, um, but that's, that we're, we're not trying to deal with that. I mean, we love the idea of, of, of more district heat networks that are more efficient and who knows, maybe the next campaign might be something to do with that. Great, thank you, Steve. So um, a question more on the campaign side again. So. I also hope to seek advice on my strategy now I've moved back to Scotland and have a different local MSP. Is this bill something that will affect Scottish, Welsh, NI energy policy too? Do I go about convincing my local politicians the same way? Sorry, I've not got your name, but that's a great question. What a great question. Thank you. Um, something I perhaps should have covered. So the bill is about getting the energy regulator Ofgem to implement the new process. Um, and Ofgem covers all of uh, Britain, so Scotland, Wales, and England. At the moment, the bill does not apply to Northern Ireland, although some of Northern Ireland MPs support it, um, and it could be extended to apply to Northern Ireland. They have a separate uh, regulator and grid. Um, whilst, so whilst the Scottish Parliament uh, and the Welsh Parliament um, aren't directly involved in making the bill law or not, um, it would be very helpful to have support uh, from members of, of both of those parliaments, or indeed from uh, the, the parliament as a whole, which is quite possible. I've seen this in the past, again, on other campaigns. Um, so it's a bit like writing to your council and asking them to back it. You could ask your MSP um, or your, your uh, member of the Senate, uh, if you're in Wales, to please um, support the bill. Um, and it would be great to see uh, any correspondence uh, you get back on that. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you very much. I believe that's, uh, that was a question from Jane May Morrison. I think that's, um, I'm apologies if this is wrong, I think that's the Jane who featured in our Community Energy Leaders video. So great to see you um, and thanks for your continuing support. Um, so next question from Jonathan Horsfield. Recently heard about energy local CIC slash local energy clubs, but as yet don't understand the details of how they operate, enabling local generation to be sold to local people. Can you explain this scheme and how it does slash doesn't relate to the local electricity bill? So what we've broadly got at the moment is we've got these different kinds of community energy groups. The so CIC is a community interest company. That's just this, one of the ways they can be registered. Um, they, uh, a lot of them, not all of them, but a lot of them actually have some generation. So it's maybe some solar panels in a field, wind turbines, a hydro unit in a river. Um, they've 
got funding together, maybe crowdfunding or, or loans, um, investment, they've got the funding together and they have built uh, that generation, which uh, obviously is great. Um, and they then uh, obviously need to sell the electricity, the power they're generating. And what most, almost all of them do um, is they have a contract with a big nationally licensed utility um, and they sell it for, well, it varies, it was about around five pence per kilowatt hour. It's a bit less than that now, um, often. Um, but it's that kind of level. Um, we, as domestic customers, buy our electricity from big licensed utility like British Gas or Eon or EDF or Good Energy or whoever. Um, and we're paying at the moment, what are we paying? 19 pence per kilowatt hour? Some of us now, more even. Um, so we're trying to create a situation. So, so none of the community energy groups at the moment sell directly to local customers. It is impossible for you or me to buy our electricity off um, a local supplier. They're all nationally, national scale, nationally licensed. So we're trying to change those rules, change the way the market works, make it possible for those community schemes to sell. So I live in, I live in North London. In the future, if we can get this bill through Parliament, there might be a North London community energy cooperative, and I could become a customer of theirs. And then when they're generating, obviously that's where my electricity is coming from. It's all going across the grid. We're not talking about new wires here. But then when they're not, um, then I'm just <coughs> they're sourcing either um, they're sourcing my energy from a lot, another wholesaler from across the grid, or it could be a bit like you know the way we buy groceries. You don't have a contract to go and buy all your groceries from Tesco, do you? So it could be that you just want when the local generator is, is not, you're switching back to your big old national utility. There's various ways to deal with it. But but the key thing we've got to achieve here is that you can buy directly from a local supplier. It's completely doable. OK, great. So it's actually eight o'clock now. We do have some questions we've not got to. If your question has not been answered, we will. Um, be answering them after the webinar. We've got some specific questions on Ofgem's consultation on business plans and the smart export guarantee, which we will get back to you on. Um, but one more question. I know it's eight o'clock, but I think it's quite apt. Diana Simpson wrote to my MP, Mary Kay Foy Labour on this and received no reply. So Steve, if you received no reply, what, what do you do? Okay, so this is a great question to end on. Um, MPs are our elected representatives. They are our democratic servants. They are meant to serve us, not the other way around. We have a very powerful deferential culture in, in, in Britain um, and we need to try and shake it off. They are our democratic servants. And it is wrong that they do not reply if you have sent, as long as of course you've been polite, do be polite. Um, so the what so what to do if they haven't replied you must persist please persist politely but please persist and i promise you it works write again and again ask to meet them get others to write in the constituency don't give up some of them some mps are good but some mps they just want you to go away don't give them what they want great Thank you, Steve. I guess that's that we'll let you to finish up the webinar now. Great. So I just I just want to re-emphasize one more time. Um, if I haven't conveyed it already, we need you to keep, please, please keep taking action. We have come a long way. This is winnable and it looks like it can be achieved, maybe even this year, which would be fantastic. But we need you to please, please keep taking those actions that I talked about. It, these campaigns only succeed through action. I know it might not sound like the most exciting thing to write another letter, but it works. Please do it and please meet with your MP as well. Please push your councillors. I've done it. I'm going to keep doing it. My MP's um, a Conservative minister, so I keep giving him a real hard time um, and he's probably getting very annoyed, but I will not give up. So, so please, I can talk till I'm blue in the face, but it won't make any difference what I do in the office here unless you all help. So please do help. Um, I want to mention one more little other thing. Um, Heidi mentioned how we're funded, but we are going to start something new uh, in probably a few weeks time, which is go we're going to be asking if people can give a regular um, donation and you'll, you'll be receiving that soon. If you feel what we're doing is good, then it would be great um, if you could please do that. 
um, and uh, we all we run off donations from individuals and and and, and grants, trusts, foundations only. Um, so look out for that. Um, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thank you for the great questions. Um, apologies, I went on a little bit too long. I wanted to have a bit more time for questions. Um, hopefully, we'll have another one of these once we've got another exciting update for you. Um, and uh, keep campaigning. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank have you, a great everyone. Evening.